Hello, and welcome to episode 14 of the Motivational Millennial Podcast. Before we introduce our guest today, I wanted to touch base with Ivy, who on our last podcast episode mentioned that she was starting the certification program with the Coaches Training Institute. And Ivy, you mentioned coactive coaching, and I was wondering if you could share with the audience a little bit more about what is coactive coaching. Yes, I would love to. Hi, guys. So the quick summary of coactive coaching is that it is a relationship that's built on trust and collaboration with the sole focus of helping you achieve your goals. So essentially, we work together to uncover the path of fulfillment that works best for you. That's really cool. And I know you mentioned as part of the certification process, you were looking to work with a couple more people. If people would be interested in working with you, how would they get in touch with you? Yeah, so right now, actually, I'm offering complimentary sessions. The first one is free, and that way you have an opportunity to find out a little bit more about what coaching is like. We can see if it sounds like a great fit. So that's the first step, and if you're interested in setting that up with me, you can contact me on Facebook at ilaclair, L-A-C-L-A-I-R, or hit me up at ivy at motivationalmillennial.com. And as someone who has benefited from Ivy's coaching, I just definitely want to encourage you to reach out if there are any goals that you're looking to accomplish right now or places you feel stuck. I've definitely experienced some awesome progress and transformation in having some great conversations with Ivy. So I'm looking forward to seeing how the certification goes and sharing with our amazing audience as well. Well, thank you. Yeah, no doubt. So today we are talking with Dave Anderson. And we first heard about Dave through the Moving Millennials podcast, which is dear and near to our hearts. <laughs> <laughs> and I met Dave in person at a youth speaker conference called Rock the Stage down in San Jose. And I went up and met him. I said, oh my gosh, you're the Dave Anderson. <laughs> Moving Millennials. Oh my gosh. And so we immediately connected. I jumped on his podcast a couple months ago at this point, and he very kindly agreed to come and talk to us and share an incredible amount of awesomeness and insights and reflections today. So I'm really looking forward to sharing that with you. Stick around after the interview for the after show where Ivy and I will discuss some of our biggest takeaways. Woohoo! Hello, welcome to the Motivational Millennial Podcast, where we talk with inspiring members of the millennial generation who are living life with a sense of purpose and achieving their dreams. I'm Blake Brandis. And I'm Ivy LeClaire. Our Motivational Millennial guest today is Dave Anderson. Dave is a professional speaker, a network marketing professional, and a choral conductor. He is the co-founder of My Life Online, an elementary school workshop teaching kids around the world to be safe, smart, and kind online. Dave is the founder of the platform Moving Millennials and host of the podcast with the same name. He is also the conductor of a boys and men's choir in Oakville, Canada called A Few Good Men. Dave, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Blake and Ivy, for having me on. This is really exciting. And it's cool to be on what I kind of think of as the sister podcast to Moving Millennials. <laughs> it's awesome. There's a lot of alliteration with the letter M going on, so this is cool. <laughs> Well, I'm curious, before we jump in, did you have a sort of massive brainstorming session to come up with the name for Movie Millennials? Yes, I did. I was on my balcony in 2014 and was just writing down a whole bunch of different words. I was so focused at that time and still am on casting a vision for young people to just kind of step into more contribution and freedom and customization of their careers. And so I wrote down the words moving millennials and I got chills in that moment. I went with it. That was the one. And the word moving for me, I'm a musician and that's my background is music. And so when I look for music, I'm always looking for music that is moving, that does something to my emotions. And so I think is one of the reasons that just using that word, I think there's just so many different angles to look at that word from. And that's why I chose that as the precursor to millennials. I love it. It uh, definitely encapsulates the mission and the vision. And when early on when we were creating Motivational Millennial and we were looking for what was out there, you were definitely the closest thing. I mean, we obviously are sort of in a different vision, 
somewhat, but I think with the same heart and values and passion to it. Certainly. So yeah. we'd love to hear yeah. more about what you're up to at the moment. And we caught a little bit of that in the intro and also sure. why you're so passionate about it. Well, I mean, I'm a guy that tend to wear a whole bunch of hats at any given time. That's kind of always been the case growing up. I mean, my parents were phenomenal in the sense that they exposed me to so many different opportunities from a very early age. And I was just very lucky and privileged to grow up in a family where experiences were valued and opportunities were valued. So from an early age, I was a Highland dancer. I have roots in Scotland. I was a competitive Highland dancer. I could dance a sword dance, a chantreuse, a Highland fling, sailor's hornpipe, and an Irish jig. If you gave me half an hour, I could do them all back to back. <laughs> so at age eight, I was Highland dancing. I went to choir camp in the summer and sang in children's choirs, and I played triple A baseball. All at the same time, I did gymnastics. So I've always kind of just had my hand in a bunch of different pots, and that has continued. And so today, what am I up to? I mean, first and foremost, I would say that I'm an educator. And my parents are both teachers. They taught in the school system for my mom for 34 years, my father for about 23, 24 years. He started a bit later. So I've always known that I was going to be a teacher in some way. And I figured out right after my university degree, when I graduated, I realized that I did not want to teach in the school system, but that I wanted to find creative outlets to use my ability to teach and communicate and really teach young people specifically, now millennials and the generation that is coming up after us. First and foremost, that's what I am. I tell people I'm a teacher, I'm an educator. And then all the different projects that I'm passionate about today are all just ways that I'm allowing myself to use that skill set of teaching that I've developed really over my entire life because I've just grown up in a family just watching my parents educate. So I'm a speaker. I travel around to schools across the country and beyond talking to students about digital citizenship, media literacy, and that's the My Life Online program. I'm a professional network marketer. I've been involved in that profession for about six or seven years now and building a team globally inside that profession. One of my real passion projects is the Boys and Men's Choir. That is just really centered around this belief that I have that more men need to find a vehicle to express themselves emotionally. And for me, singing has become the thing that I just feel is so powerful that when you can bring young men together and have them expressing themselves through music, through song, and using their voices where you're stripping away any blocks of instruments, any of those walls, it's just kind of like you're putting young men in into their most vulnerable space of expression. And it's a legacy project for me, A Few Good Men. I'm really passionate about that. And what else? I mean, I'm a dad now. I have a three-month-old son. And really, everything I do now more than ever Every time I create something, every time I'm recording a podcast, I shot some YouTube videos last week, I think about the fact that one day Brady is going to consume the stuff that I'm making right now. Everything. Every choir performance, I just think about what is Brady going to learn from consuming my storybook in 20 years. What to you is the most exciting part about being an educator, a teacher? I love the connection that I see and feel amongst the students that I get to work with and the connection that the relationship that I get to develop between myself and the people that I'm working with. And I'm really interested and curious about transformation and breakthrough. So I'll use my choir, The Few Good Men, as an example. When I see young guys coming into the group at age six and seven, really shy, not really saying much, really nervous to sing, and then watching them three, four, five years later with all the confidence in the world singing a solo in front of 300 people, I am just so moved and fascinated by figuring out how does that happen and how can I help to give the guys in that community even more self-esteem self-confidence, self-love, to help them increase their self-worth, and just to see the transformation that takes place in all the different projects that I'm involved with. That is really, to me, what is most exciting. And I know that you've grown through your own musical performance as well, and I'd love if you could share a little bit of 
the transformative journey from the acoustic opera into my life online. Sure. So six years ago, my business partner, Blake, and I, not to be confused with Blake Brandis, the one and only, <laughs> uh, but his name is Blake Flyshacker. And if you haven't already, you should have him on the show, blakefly.com. And he and I got together. We had known each other from university. We weren't actually that close in university, more acquaintances, but we got together for lunch. We had both recently left our jobs, our full-time jobs, the cushy jobs that we moved into right after our university degrees were wrapped up. We got together and we realized that we both shared this passion for educating young people and we decided that we would put our heads together and come up with a one-hour anti-bullying show. We called it the Acoustic Opera. So acoustic because Blake plays acoustic guitar and opera because I have experience singing opera. So we wrote this show and for about four and a half years, we performed it an awful lot. I think to date we've done the show over 550 times, presented in front of a whole lot of students. And we kind of realized about, I guess, two years or so ago that while acoustic opera is a tremendous show, it's so wrapped around our unique skill sets and abilities, the opera singing, the acoustic guitar, the humor. We share a lot of personal stories. And we realized that if we wanted to really have a massive impact on a lot of kids around the world, we needed to create something that did not depend on Dave and Blake to go and present. And for me, although I grew up singing, I've kind of moved away from singing in the last few years, mostly because I'm just so much more excited about speaking and about conducting. And I'm more excited about facilitating large groups of singers than I am about actually standing up in front of a group and singing myself. And that's just an evolution that's happened for me organically over the last four to six years. And could you talk a little bit about, you mentioned making the leap from the cushy out-of-college job into this brave new world of defining your own path. Could you talk a little bit more about that transition? Oh, yeah. That really, for me, was, as I look back my life, one of the top three or four decisions that I've ever made. And it was also certainly amongst the top three or four scariest, most terrifying decisions I've ever made. And if anyone out there listening has ever gone through that kind of a transition where you're kind of in this groove, in this routine, you've got the salary, you've got the benefits. For me, I worked for Apple in the retail division. So I was a specialist at the Apple store. It was really trendy. And I had stock options with, with Apple that I was buying into twice a year, which was really cool. Group RRSP with Apple and Phenomenal culture, phenomenal training and development. And I was actually, by the end of that, end of those two years, I was doing a whole lot of speaking and training on behalf of Apple. So every other weekend, I'd be doing three days in a fancy hotel with 50 new Apple recruits. And I'd be the guy basically injecting the Apple juice, so to speak, <laughs> into those people and getting them fired up to work inside the Apple store. And then I would take smaller groups in my home store and take them through five days of in-store training. So by the end of my time at Apple, I was doing very little sales work on the floor, which I also loved, but I was doing a ton of speaking through these core trainings for Apple and then also lots of in-store training. And toward the middle half of 2010, I woke up one morning. I said to my girlfriend at the time, Jenny, and she's now my wife and mother of our beautiful son, Brady. But I said to her, I said, it no longer takes courage for me to get up and go to work. It feels too easy. And for me, that was a sign. That was kind of a cue that perhaps my time in that world had come to an end. And I had this burning desire, which kind of went back a few years before when I was first introduced to network marketing. And I don't know if you guys talk about network marketing a lot on this show, or if anyone in the audience out there, if, if you're involved in that profession. But when I was introduced to network marketing, it sort of was the first thing that opened my eyes to the possibility of living this kind of freedom lifestyle where I could decide what I wanted to do every day, where Saturday and Wednesday didn't carry any separate energy. Like Saturday was just as good as Wednesday and Friday was just as great as Monday. And it opened me up to this possibility that I could also choose how much income I wanted to create. And as a result, how many people I could impact and how much freedom I could have. So from that point, I'd been kind of like itching to get off on my own. And so August 22nd, 2010, I walked away from Apple for good and leapt into the relatively unknown, although I had some projects already going that were paying me a little bit. 
So my network marketing business, I was teaching private voice lessons. So using my skill directly that I had developed in university to charging $50, $60 an hour. And I had a handful of students at the time when I left my job, maybe four or five, which I grew to like 17, 18 in my studio. And I don't do that anymore. But And I was also singing in a couple of community choirs that were also paid opportunities. My boys' choir didn't exist yet. My speaking career had not started yet. I didn't know that was going to come up. That didn't happen until after I left my job, which kind of leads me to this idea that if I had not taken that leap, I would never have met for lunch with Blake. And if I hadn't have met for lunch with Blake, we would not have created the Acoustic Opera. We would not have created My Life Online. I probably wouldn't be, definitely wouldn't have started the podcast a couple years ago. And I would not be sitting here right now having this interview with you. It really speaks to the Steve Jobs quote that you can't connect the dots moving forward, only looking back. And when I look back, I can see how these dots all connect. At the time, I was just going to teach some voice lessons and build a network marketing business. I today don't teach voice lessons. I still build a network marketing business, but I also have these other projects that I just could never have even imagined that day on August 22nd, 2010. I love that you said that it, this, all of this came from the realization that there wasn't enough challenge in your life. So I'm wondering how you keep that feeling of challenge in your life even now. I think that for me, I only choose to work on projects with no ceiling. And that is how I keep the challenge. So I'll explain what I mean by that. For me, my job at Apple had a very definitive ceiling. The role that I was in, I was going to continue to get paid a certain amount. I was going to continue to work certain hours, and they were retail hours, which I didn't like. I was going to continue to be notified on Thursday of one week when I'd be working the next week. I was going to continue to be doing the same activities in day in, day out for the foreseeable future. And I knew that I could get promotions. I mean, obviously, people, everyone understands that when you work for a corporation, there's like this possibility of promotion. But in two years, by the end of two years, I was already dead tired of playing the game of trying to figure out what I needed to do and how I needed to act and who I needed to be friends with strategically to put myself in position to get that next promotion. And I just didn't want to play that game at all. So when I moved to working for myself, and now I don't even think about it that way. I don't work for myself. I work for moving millennials. I work for my life online. I work for my boys choir. And even though, yes, I have control and I get to kind of choose my hours, I try never to say that I work for myself because I work for these entities and they are like living, breathing spirits almost that have their <laughs> own energy and their own vision and they are separate from me and I serve them. That's just how I frame it for myself. And each one of those projects, now I see them anyway as having no ceiling. So because there's no ceiling, there's always challenge because they will all grow to the extent that I'm willing to grow myself. Hmm. And they're limitless. So I just choose to only play in limitless opportunities. <laughs> That's really cool. That might be the tagline for the episode right there. <laughs> <laughs> so along this path that you described, what is one big challenge that you faced and how have you overcome it? Can I share two? Please. <laughs> We don't so, want people to think it's easy. <laughs> man, it's not easy at all. It's really hard, and, and I don't even know that it's for everyone. I want it to be for everyone. I so badly want this to be for everyone mm. because it's really awesome. And we just had our Brady three months ago, and for the whole month of May, he was born April 28th, I was able to spend every single waking millisecond with Jenny and Brady for the whole month. And then even June, I mean... I went back to work, but I work downstairs in our house and I take like seven breaks a day. I just run upstairs and like kiss them and then I come back downstairs. So I so badly want this for everyone because it's really awesome, but I don't know that it is. The two biggest challenges, number one, self-motivation, number two, self-esteem. So I'll just talk about self-motivation. When you leave an environment where someone is telling you what to do every single day, and you move into a space with this magical, limitless opportunity that Dave Anderson talks about, but then also no one is telling you to do anything when you get up in the morning. That is very difficult. It's a very real challenge that I think a lot of people that who do work like we do kind of wrestle with. And that's something that I wrestle with. I remember my first week, I took a couple of weeks off after I left my job, and it was September 2010, 
And my wife, Jenny's a teacher. So after Labor Day, she went back to work and I woke up in our apartment and I didn't have a job, but the world was my oyster. And I just remember like getting up that first day and I thought, I can do whatever I want. I'm going to go for a run. I didn't even run. I didn't even like running. But I'm like, <laughs> I feel like this is what successful entrepreneurs do. I'm going to get my running <laughs> shoes on. I'm going to get my shorts on. And we lived really close to the lake. And that was just sexy to me. So I just like ran down by the lake. <laughs> and there's these rocks by the lake. I started hopping on the rocks, like doing like lunges <laughs> and broad jumps, like kind of two feet and then swinging my And I'm like, this is the life right here. <laughs> Then I came back and I'm like, I can do whatever I want. I'm going to have breakfast. So I like made myself a sweet breakfast. <laughs> and then I sat on the balcony and I'm like, I'm going to meditate and eat my breakfast at the same time. Or like, I'm going <laughs> to eat my breakfast. I'm going to meditate. And I'm going to write. It was like one o'clock in the afternoon by the time I finished all this stuff. <laughs> and I'm like, huh, maybe I should do some work. And I might be exaggerating a little bit, but it was really like that. I mean, you have all this time. But it's very difficult to find within yourself that real long-lasting motivation. And it really does feel sometimes like it goes in waves. Like some days you wake up and you're just like, I'm all over this. I'm so crazy productive. It's not even fair. Other days you wake up and you're like, all I want to do is watch Full House on Netflix. That <laughs> like that's it. If you just give me some Full House, I'll be good. That's really a challenge. How do I overcome it? It's easier now in a way. Because I wake up and I see Brady and I see Jenny and we have some big goals for our family and that is what drives me. Before Brady, I try to just kind of build in a routine in the morning that gets me in the right spot. I'm certainly not perfect with that routine. I try to be really consistent, but it's really just Tony Robbins talks about your physiology dictates your psychology so that when you start to move your body and just change your physical state, you can actually it kind of trick your mind or teach your mind to get into this more motivated, energized state. And so I try to get up. I try to do some journaling, try to move. I try not to let it take four hours of my morning. That's the key is to not let this fancy morning routine that you sculpt for yourself become this like half a day event. Uh, and then it's lunchtime. You're like, well, I've done my morning routine. So I'm obviously in a good mindset now. That's what you don't want. Challenge number two is I think the bigger one, and that's self-esteem, I think it's one of the biggest challenges for everyone on our planet. And I think it's one of the biggest things I'm trying to nurture with the young men that I work with, the kids that I speak to. How do I help them develop more authentic self-esteem? So where it shows up for me is it's tempting to compare myself to other people. And a lot of the time, when you guys started your podcast, you talked about it a little while ago, you initially kind of looked out. You went onto iTunes and you did some searches and you're like, oh, wow, look at all these other people doing similar podcasts. For every motivational millennial, like you guys did it, you executed, you've built it. There are probably 50 other people who just like did a search, realized that there was another podcast with the word millennial in it and then just didn't do it because they thought, oh, someone else has done it. And because their vision isn't clear yet. And they see someone else's vision, like you guys or like me, and they're like, oh, there's this millennial podcast and there's this millennial podcast. Well, I don't need to do it. But they're comparing their confusion to someone else's clarity. And they don't realize that like you went through the same confusion and the same doubt. And I, before I started my podcast, went through the same confusion, the same doubt, just at a different time. And I'm going through that right now with video. Like I've been wanting to do some more YouTube stuff. And just this past Friday, I went out and filmed, I got someone and I filmed five YouTube videos that will be coming out soon. But for the longest time over the last few months, I've been watching other people's YouTube videos going, oh man, like they're really good. This is great stuff. I don't even know that I could compare to this. Got fancy words flashing on the videos and they've got all these special effects. And look at this intro part. It's like an animated logo and it flies <laughs> across the screen and like, oh my God, like they're clearly using the top of the line camera equipment and where am I going to get? That's going to cost you like $2,000. See, like this is the noise that I think runs through the minds of too many people. And that low self-esteem is actually the root cause of that. And I think also overconsumption in our world today. We're so bombarded with information, with other people's videos, with other people's podcasts, and we consume a lot of stuff. And if you're anything like me, you read a lot of books, right? Personal development books, leadership books. You're always trying to sharpen the saw, so to speak. And I think this is awesome. But also overconsumption, I think, can be a massive fuel source for comparison. And then comparison 
causes paralysis. We need to watch out for that and continuously be focused on building up your self-esteem. You need your inner voice instead of saying things like, Blake and Ivy are already doing a millennial podcast. Dave's already doing a millennial podcast or this YouTuber is already rocking out on fitness videos or whatever, right? It doesn't matter. This person already has the best travel blog in the world. Your inner voice needs to be saying, I can totally, I have something that's valuable to say and I need to be creating my own videos and putting out my own podcast and acting on the ideas that are in my mind instead of just looking for other people's stuff and then doing nothing because of that lack of self-esteem. Yeah, and I think a lot of that self-esteem that you just described comes from embracing your personal journey and saying, how are you uniquely adding to this conversation? And I don't mean your journey in terms of all your successes. I mean, what problems have you had in your life that you've been able to overcome or that you are still dealing with? Because I think sometimes people say, oh, I haven't achieved to the level of X person that you're describing in the social media comparison example. But sometimes we don't need someone who is Tony Robbins level doing stadium sized events. Maybe we need to hear about your struggle growing up in your hometown and trying to make it out. That could really speak to somebody who's in a similar situation. And I also think of comparison, not just when we're comparing to other people, but also when we compare ourself with ourself. So for example, when you were talking about self-motivation and how some days you wake up and you said, I'm so productive, it's not even fair. Because I think what can happen is the day that you wake up and you're not feeling as productive or you're feeling like you just kind of want to lay and take it chill. For me, at least, there can be a, why am I not as productive as I was the other day? Yeah, What do I need to change about this day? Did I not wake up at the right time? So there's a self-acceptance piece. Mm -hmm. It's very similar to understanding, you know, where we are in our own journey and honoring our own journey. There's a self-acceptance piece that underlines that as well. Yeah, and it never ends. Like, no. It's not like you just like, oh, I accept myself right now and then I'll be good. Like it's I'll never practice. have to do that again. Because then tomorrow there's going to be a new challenge or you're in a funk for a completely different reason. You have to consistently be doing that self-acceptance work, I think. It's not like you just, I'll do it once and I'll be good. Yeah, so I wonder, what do you do in those moments? Because you say that there are moments where you might be questioning things, but then it's about having that dialogue that's motivating and self-accepting. So what do you do in those moments? Well, I think everyone kind of finds their own strategies over time. I certainly have some things that work for me. And you've got to have this person on your podcast. One of the people that has provided the, so much value for me in the last few years is a girl named Peta Kelly. I don't know if you guys have come across her at all. P-E-T-A Kelly is her last name. And she introduced me to a book called Meet Your Soul. And it's by Elisa Romeo, Romeo, it's E-L-I-S-A, and then last name is spelled like Romeo. And in that book, it talks about this exercise called soul journaling and creating this relationship with what she refers to as your higher self or your soul. She goes as far as to say that you can like name your soul. And anyway, I'm not going to get into the nuts and bolts of the book, but that has been a resource for me that's powerful so that when I get in these places of fogginess, and lack of belief in myself, lack of clarity, that I can kind of sit with the journal and do some, what I simply refer to as soul journaling now, mm-hmm. where I'm kind of just listening for my personal and unique voice of truth. Mm-hmm. It's often quite shocking in terms of what actually comes through in those moments where I'll sit still, I'll just put on some music or I'll put on, I use an app called Brainwave to kind of like zone out, puts on these like binaural brainwaves with some background noise and stuff, white noise. And I'll just kind of listen. I'll ask questions to my soul. It sounds super hokey, but it's really interesting in terms of what comes up and the clarity that I can walk away with from those sessions, even if I just do five, 10 minutes. It's really, really powerful. One thing that I wanted to just kind of go back to talking about comparison and what we were just chatting about a couple minutes ago, number one lessons I have taken from Peta, and she's got this phenomenal platform. I'm part of her mastermind group called The Supercharged. She has another program called Let It Rip Launchpad. And I was at her event in Scottsdale, Arizona called The New Way Live at the end of May. 
But she talked about creating. You can create from two different spaces when you're creating anything. You can either create from hierarchy or you can create from territory. And when you create from hierarchy, that's when you are creating from a place of comparison. So you put out a podcast episode, you put out a show, you put out anything. Even with my boys' choir, I do a performance and I'm only thinking about how it compared to another choir down the street. Or I'm only thinking about how this podcast episode compares to the, all the other guests that you've had on, right? Or I can sit in my own territory and create from territory. And when you create from territory, no one can touch you. So you are literally untouchable because you, and this is like a truth that Peter talks about all the time, you are uncomparable. Incomparable? Uncomparable? Incomparable. Yeah. Incomparable, <laughs> right. Yeah, Blake, you would know that. <laughs> yeah, so you are incomparable. Like, it's impossible to compare yourself with anyone else, no matter what. And there are people that whose podcasts get more listeners than mine, than yours. Does that matter? Absolutely not. It is completely irrelevant. Very few, what I know is very few people on this planet have a boys choir like I do. That's my territory. Like, no one can touch me. So while I'm doing that, someone else is sending out more tweets than I do and they get more listeners to their podcast. Who cares? And they're creating from their territory and I can create from my territory and our territories will never even have to touch because there's that much space, right? It's infinite. It's not, there never even needs to be overlap. It's all perceived. Any overlap that we think exists is completely made up. And you just have your own territory and it can be as big as you want and it's not going to touch anyone else's. Coming from that place of abundance can be really helpful because I find when I'm at my most fearful and least empowered is when I am in that comparative, I'm not good enough relative to this person, this person, there's not enough listenership, viewership, mind share. It's like, no, the more greatness that we put out into the world, the more it generates. In fact, that's really the best part of it is it's, a positive cycle of creation exactly and the best visual that i have for this is if you you know when you're like in gym class in elementary school and you're sitting in your class and there's maybe like 30 people in the gym and the phys ed teacher says everyone get up and go find your space around in the gym and then the way that you check that is you like put your arms out to the side and you start like turning to make sure that you don't hit anyone else right well, I think a lot of the time when it comes to all the stuff we're talking about, when it comes to business, when it comes to starting a passion project, whether it's a podcast, YouTube channel, a blog, anything that's creative, where you're putting yourself out there, I think people are almost thinking of it as that kind of a situation where you're in this gym and there's always other people that you can see. You just like don't want to touch anyone else. <laughs> but it's actually not like that at all. It's actually a situation where you have your own gym. Like... There's no one else in the gym. But the thing is, you go on Facebook, you go on YouTube, and it looks like there's other people in the gym and you don't want to touch them. You don't want to like bump into them because you think there's, it's kind of crowded in the gym. There's too many students. There's too many people. There's too many creators. There's too many athletes, whatever, right? But we have to realize that we have our own gym. And that gym is as big as you want. It has all the apparatus that you want. So if you want a basketball net, it has a basketball net. If you want like ropes to climb or a rock climbing wall, that's what it has. Whatever toys you want in that space, you got it. And you can't bump into anyone else. It's impossible. You said a little bit ago that we have a tendency to look at, for example, other people's podcast downloads and they have more than us. And you said it's not relevant. So... What is relevant? What's relevant is constantly working to discover your own genius. And everyone has their own unique genius. So much of this I have learned and adapted from PETA, who's really been my closest mentor over the last two years. And I used to talk about this even before I knew her, that there are a handful of different freedoms in life, time freedom, financial freedom, freedom in your relationships, freedom in your health, your physical freedom then also the freedom to pursue your genius. So I think what matters the most is, are you continuously working to access your full potential and whatever it is, it's your genius, right? So if for me, in the world of choral conducting, which is, it's like this, to a lot of people, I'm a choral conductor, they don't even know what that is. 
but it's like this whole world and like it's a whole universe unto itself and there are like there's this massive network globally of like thousands of choral conductors who conduct choirs at high schools and universities and children's choirs and it's easy to get into this game of comparison like who's the best conductor and see in that space there's a lot of ego because as much as it's about the kids and it's about the singing and it's about the music the level of the choir is very much so in that world a direct reflection of the competency and the vision of the conductor and the same with orchestras and it's like a sports team right it's like when the team is not performing the coach gets fired right yeah players get traded players get let go but at the end of the day if it continues it's well the coach's fault so i think for me what matters in that space whether it's in conducting or podcasting or speaking right is to not get caught up in metrics to not get caught up in perceived areas of strength for other people but to really just focus in on am i spending enough time in my zone of genius and for me the zone of genius is where like what is that thing that you do that when you do that thing time dissolves you could lose track of time it feels easy you could talk about it for hours on end and not even really have to think about what you're saying when I'm conducting. I don't even, I kind of move into this other space. I've got the education, I've got the training, but then I'm moving my hands. I feel like I'm moving the sound with my hands and it comes so naturally that in those moments I feel untouchable. And I feel like that when I'm speaking sometimes too in front of students. I'm just up there, I'm talking and I'm in flow. And so that's what matters is, spending more time in that space and less time in this analytical comparative space. And that's really hard because if you read a lot of the business books or marketing books, it's so much about metrics. If you want to improve something, you have to measure it. And that can really be a trap. And I think Brene Brown talks about that really nicely in her TED Talk because she says for the longest time she had a little post-it note above her desk that said, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. And she said what she found over time that actually, if you can measure it, it probably doesn't matter that much. <laughs> and there are certain things too about running a business that it can be really hard because you think there is a bottom line here. And if we don't have X amount of revenue, then we can't pay our staff or Absolutely. cover yeah. our expenses. And so yep. what's great about what you're saying is operating from that place of scarcity and fear does not help you. When you're in the zone of genius, you are marshalling all of the resources at your disposal. You are strong, confident, powerful, looking for opportunities. And that's something I've really been trying to learn on this journey that Ivy and I have been taking with Motivational Millennial is to recognize that yes, there are realities of the business world that are <laughs> involved metrics, but focusing on those does not help me produce my best work. And focusing on those does not help us create an inspiring, compelling vision for our business. Right. I think you're absolutely right. And this is not to say that you have to kind of avoid the real world and pretend like those things don't exist. But what I've found time and again is the moment I stop creating for the sake of metrics is the moment that I start putting out my best work. And then as a result of that, the moment the metrics come. Because I'm not creating for others. I'm not creating for numbers. I'm not creating for views. I'm not creating for downloads. I'm just creating for the sake of, like, I have to do this. This is in me, and it needs to get out. And I'm not doing it to impress anyone. I'm not doing it for anyone's approval. It's really tough to get into this space where you're genuinely just putting stuff out because you need to. It's tough because we want to please people. We want to impress people. We want to look successful. And I don't think anyone's exempt from this. So, Dave, with Moving Millennials, your audience is millennials. What do you think is the most important thing for millennials who are on a path toward fulfillment and success to know? Get off the path. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's what they need to know. So I've talked a lot about this. You can either be pulled by your vision or you can follow a path. When you follow a path, you are looking to others, to society, to people who have gone before you, to your parents, to your friends, your coworkers, you are looking to them for your next steps. And when you're contemplating what to do next or where to turn, you're like, okay, well, what do these people do? What does this person do? I'm just going to kind of model them. And there's definitely a time and place for modeling. 
but it needs to be far more – I think you can model skills and you can model behaviors, but don't necessarily model other people's decisions and ABC one, two, threes, like their paths, hmm. right? Model their behavior, absolutely. If there's like a, someone who's a phenomenal leader – and you feel like your personality, like it's very similar with theirs and you just, oh yeah, I want to embody a little bit of what they've got. Totally do that. If there's someone that's like masterful at speaking and you want to up your game and you think that this person is just a great model for you given their personality and your personality, yes, do the work and begin to model their behaviors and their skills. And over time, you'll still create your own authentic expression of that leveling up. But don't model their path because it's impossible. And so the alternative to that is that you need to begin with the end in mind and create your own unique compelling vision that's crystal clear in your own mind's eye and then allow that to pull you. So when you follow a vision or you're pulled by a vision, it's where you allow the legacy that you wish to leave dictate the work that you create. Mm -hmm. So millennials, more than any generation in history, I think, are beginning with legacy. They're beginning with meaning. When you follow a path, you go about your life, ABC123, and you hope that by the time you quote unquote retire, which is also an idea that needs to be thrown out in our generation, but that when you get to this point of retirement, you hope that you've left a legacy behind you. Legacy is work that outlives you. It doesn't mean that you die and then the work continues. It means that you might move on from the project and that the impact, the trail of positive impact continues even once you are finished working on that project. So legacy is work that continues after you're done being involved with whatever that is. So when you follow a path, you hope that there's going to be some kind of legacy at the end of it all. So what does that legacy and vision look like for you right now that you're trying to create? It's a little bit different in each one of my projects. So I shape a legacy and a vision for each thing and it's constantly evolving. So for, was well, there one that you want me to talk about specifically? I could kind of go through all of them, but that might take a little while. What are you most curious about? I was curious if there's an overarching one, but I like how you've broken it down so that it's actually kind of project or silo specific. Mm -hmm. um, something that probably has more clarity. So you want my life online to look like what you want your choir to look like. Is there one kind of encapsulates all of it in some way? Yeah, I think so. I think that at the end of it all, I place such a high value on freedom and choice. And that might sound a little bit cliche, but I really feel like I am constantly working to live a life with as much real freedom and choice as possible in everything that I'm doing, I am working to help other people discover more freedom and choice. And most of that freedom is internal, but then it manifests in the external world. The boys choir, that is very much about helping these guys that they start off with me when they're six years old and the oldest singer in my choir is about 30. So it's very much about helping them grow up into this personal freedom where they just are where they're confident where they feel like they can express themselves where they feel completely comfortable getting emotional and as men i think we need to be able to feel that music is so powerful at helping these guys achieve that so i hope that when they're adults they live in this personal freedom and that they then transfer that onto their kids and so on and so forth the work that i do in network marketing is very much centered around helping people and specifically young families our young parents who have kids, helping them to redefine the model of what a family looks like today and what a family feels like. So I talk about helping parents create full-time families. And the vision of ours, mine and Jenny's, to be able to have a full-time family where, yes, we work. Yes, we have projects that we're excited about. But our fullest time job for both of us is our family. And then everything else is kind of, we build it around that. Not an instance where one parent works, the other parent stays home, or both parents work. But this lifestyle where we just have a full-time family and we both have things that we work on, but at the core of it, in terms of the time that we spend week to week, it's just all centered around enriching our family life. My Life Online, it's about freedom and choice, right? So helping students to realize that they live in this world, they're growing up in this world with social media and technology where they have so much freedom to create to innovate, to share their ideas, to start 
to create a movement around a cause that they're really passionate about. They don't have to wait until they're graduated from college to start that thing, right? A 12-year-old can start a business now. Not that they couldn't 25 years ago, but it's just so tangible and achievable. And sometimes a 12-year-old starting a business is going to be more effective than a 22-year-old or 27-year-old starting the same business because they have fewer inhibitions and they don't have as many doubts. They're just willing to go for it and put themselves out there. They're growing up in this social media age where they don't even think about what they're putting online. They're just kind of like doing it. So with that program, we are really focused on giving young people, just empowering them with this freedom and choice to understand that they're growing up in a really cool time and that if they just kind of adopt some simple principles that are evergreen that lasts forever they can build this really cool life using the internet as a tool to do that so i don't know if that makes sense but i think the threads the common threads throughout all of the things that i'm doing freedom and choice are kind of the things that everything falls back on we definitely relate to that hashtag freedom was one of our business mottos when we founded motivational millennial <laughs> yeah so we're very much in alignment there and as we're wrapping up here dave You've already shared so much incredible wisdom with us. Is there a motivational quote or a phrase or a book that has really mm. changed your life? The book that I'm really getting into these days, and Blake, you know this because we talked about it on the podcast you did with me, but is The Power of Awareness by Neville Goddard. And a lot of people just refer to him as Neville. So you might just see that name, N-E-V-I-L-L-E, -L -L -E, Power of Awareness. And it's all about the law of assumption. And I think this is a book that, it was written decades ago. Hardly anyone, when I ask people, have you read this book? Hardly anyone has read it. And to me, it is the most game-changing book that I've ever read. It's so short, you could read it in two hours, but it's so dense that you need a year to digest it. And you need to read it over and over and over again, listen to it. That is, for me, the book I'm going through over and over and over again right now. In terms of a quote, here's something that I think that I've been writing about recently. I hope it's valuable. It's around the topic of mastery. And when you're looking to spend more time in your zone of genius and master your craft, whatever that is for you, it, this is so open-ended, it's not even funny. One thing I've been trying to communicate lately is that frequency is more important than duration. Here's what I mean by that. It's more important that you work on something repeatedly, even for short amounts of time, than that you spend a long time working on one thing today. When I was a kid studying piano, my mom used to tell me that it was more important that I practice for 20 minutes today and then did it again tomorrow than that I practice for two hours today. She never wanted me to practice for two hours today. It was always practice for 15 minutes, practice for 20 minutes, and then do it again tomorrow, and then do it again the next day. Frequency over duration. Duration leads to exhaustion, right? If I go to the gym today and work out for three and a half hours, that's cool, but I'm just going to be exhausted and I might be too exhausted to go back again tomorrow. If I go to the gym today for 25 minutes and then do it again tomorrow and the next day and the next day, that's going to really compound over time. If people have heard about the slight edge, the compound effect, exactly what I'm talking about. Duration leads to exhaustion. Frequency leads to mastery. Duration is daunting. Frequency is fulfilling because it leads to longevity and mastery. That's beautiful. I feel like I could use that in so many areas of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. If one related question, you've interviewed a lot of people on Moving Millennials over the years. What common characteristics or traits have you seen these millennials who are defining their own journey, who are creating their own gym, who are not following the path? What kind of common traits do you see them having in all their diversity, I'm sure? That's a good question. I'm just kind of running through. I'm going to open up my show notes here. Oh my gosh. I think that to a degree, every single one of them is just willing to take a risk. Risk tolerance is completely personal. It's different for everyone. And risk is not just about money, just like success is not just about money, but that's part of it, right? Sometimes you're risking money. Sometimes success means that someone has provided enough value that money is the outcome. But risk is that each one of the people that I have interviewed at some point in time we're willing to make a decision that may have caused other people to question whether or not they were sane. <laughs> <laughs> and even if that was just like their mom, like, I don't mean that like all these people have these massive audiences and they had all this, everyone on Facebook was commenting like, are you sane? Are you crazy? Why? No, it, it's just, they might've had 
a friend who knew what they were up to questioning their sanity. When I left my job, I mean, there are people that I worked with that were like, why are you leaving this? This is great. And for them, that was true. For me, I'm like, I am only at like 22% of my potential doing this job and it's never going to get higher than that. Yeah, I can get better at this job, but like I am capable. I just knew my self-esteem was at a point at least where I knew that I was capable of at least like 10 times what I was achieving in that role. Mm. And it didn't have anything to do with the people I was working with, the people I worked for, nothing to do with Apple. I mean, one of the best companies on the planet, but I needed to have enough risk tolerance to let that go and to trust myself. So I guess a little bit of risk tolerance and enough belief in themselves, enough self-esteem that they were able to give it a shot. I really like that. And the idea too, that you had this image of yourself as someone who had more potential than you were currently tapping into. And so that story of who you are and what you were capable of was more substantial than what you were accessing at the time yeah and i think all these people too like me like you guys they choose to play in limitless opportunities and it's just a paradigm shift i don't think a lot of people realize that they can play in limitless opportunities a lot of people don't realize they are playing in opportunities that are very limited with a very definitive ceiling and a lot of them are already at the ceiling they're so close to the ceiling they don't even see it they're like right under it So I'm constantly on this mission to kind of point out to people that, hey, you know that there's like way more than you're accessing right now. Like we live in this infinite reality. Like there's no end to creativity. There's no end to abundance, to affluence. There's no end to leadership. But so many people are just, they're choosing to play this game that is capped where their rules are limiting. Need to stop playing that game. I'm just letting that sink in for a second. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you're right, and I think it's a hard place to be in because not everyone likes to be told. I think that what happens is that people, like you're saying, they're playing within these limits and they have this scarcity mindset because they see when they look around them or what they're perceiving is that only a certain number, like a few number of people have abundance or a few number of people are successful. And so... Like you're saying, they're playing in these limited parameters without even seeing it. But that's what's creating the parameters is like the belief that they exist in the first place. And if they, like you're saying, people were to open up their minds and allow for the possibility of a paradigm shift of what they think is possible for themselves and in this world, that is going to prove to them over and over again, wow, there is something greater out there. Absolutely. Dave, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Would you mind telling our audience where they can find you and your work online? Sure. Movingmillennials.com and mylifeonlineworkshop.com. And the YouTube channel for my boys and men's choir is youtube.com slash OCC for Oakville Children's Choir. So OCC a few good men. YouTube.com slash OCC a few good men. That'll do it. Sweet. Dave. The Movie Millennials podcast host. (laughs) Thanks, Ivy. Thanks, Blake. (laughs) Thank you so much. We'll catch you soon. Awesome. Welcome to the after show of our conversation with Dave Anderson. So much wisdom. Yeah, we could have kept talking to him for hours. Yes, and we almost did. (laughs) We did. We almost did. So one of the things that Dave said was one of his biggest challenges was self-motivation. After he left his secure, stable job at Apple to embark on his own journey less traveled. I guess it's path less traveled is really the phrase normally used, but he didn't like the term path. So <laughs> I was trying to come up with something else. <laughs> but yeah, that sounds good. Journey less traveled. His journey good. less traveled. His own unique voyage. <laughs> Let's say that. He was Captain Janeway. So <laughs> sorry, I can never resist a Star Trek reference. <laughs> Love her. Okay. I know. Anyway, Dave, we're talking about you. So, <laughs> <laughs> not Captain Janeway. But I really related to the struggle of going through school or a traditional job where you have very predefined goals and metrics that you are going to need to meet. And that if you meet them, you're successful. 
And so when you embark on your own journey in your own path, you now are creating all of those deadlines and goals for yourself. And no one gives you a pat on the back when you do them right. You just have to have the inner joy and conviction of knowing that you're doing something that's meaningful, hopefully, in the world. But sometimes you can go a long time without receiving external feedback. And I think that's such a huge shift mentally, especially for most of us who were in some kind of formal education system for 12 years of our life, or maybe even 16 if people went to college, or maybe even longer if people went to a postgraduate degree. And so going from your entire life being built around here or someone giving you these goals and deadlines and structure, and now you are completely on your own and you create it all yourself is the blessing and the curse. So I know that you and I have talked about this some with Motivational Millennial because on one hand, wow, we could do anything. We can do the coaching, we can do the podcast, we can do these workshops. There's so many great opportunities and that's not even taking into consideration collaborating with other people on projects they're working on. We quickly come down to is we have to have focus and create internal structure for us. Otherwise, it just feels overwhelming and so... When Dave talks about self-motivation, is one of the biggest challenges. I think that applies to people who, in all kinds of backgrounds and journeys, who are on this course to do whatever they want to do with their life. Yeah, my favorite imagery around this was him talking about first day that he had total freedom, <laughs> and how he's like, I can do whatever I want, and then it's like this amazing walk and this breakfast, and yeah, I definitely feel like there's an awesome beauty in the freedom because what he's speaking to is filling your day with activities that you really enjoy and that you really love like well, having a big breakfast or journaling or drinking coffee or whatever that happens to be for you and so I feel like at least for me one of the challenges of working, as he put it, for Motivation Millennial, <laughs> working, working for myself, has been allowing the work or the productivity that is tasks that Motivational Millennial forward to also be really enjoyable and really exciting and really fun. Because I think we also get conditioned. There's a plus side of having the structure and having the feedback, but we also get to conditioned to feel like it is work. And like, we're at school and now we're here from eight to three and oh, we're here with the teachers and then we're at work. So we get conditioned to equate those kinds of activities with something we have to do because someone is telling us to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's a shift to allow the realization that we are giving ourselves these tasks. We are giving ourselves what, in effect, are gifts to create this amazing life that we love. And so for me, that's one of the goals is how can everything that I'm doing be something that I consider just as enjoyable as a cup of coffee or something like that? You're right. We get in patterns of conceiving of work as work mm -hmm. and one example at the time we're recording this after show ivy and i are working on a tedx talk that i'll be giving in hickory this coming month and one of the big challenges i've had over the last month is it's a great opportunity. It's this incredible <laughs> gift yeah. to have a platform for 18 minutes to talk about anything we want that will hopefully help people and inspire and present a challenging idea to the world. And I've been struggling with it so much because it feels like a task. It's like a final exam or something. And I've really had to scale out a little bit and be like, this is one moment where I get to share something that we are really passionate about and really have been working hard on. And it's just going to be a moment in our trajectory and in our story. And it's going to be a great one and we're going to prepare for it and it's going to be fun. But at the end of the day, it's one moment and it doesn't define who we are as people. Our self-worth is not tied up in it. But you can hear as I'm describing this. 
the kind of justification and mental Olympics I'm having to do to just wrap my head around this as something that's incredible and positive and fun, to your point. Yeah, it's fun. But it's hard. You know, we're creating this. Yeah, it's absolutely right. But I think it's important to remember that, too, whenever we're pursuing hobbies or we have other goals, you know, outside of work. So for people who are also working, but we have all of this other swaths of time (laughs) with which we can do anything we want. And so also the self-motivation piece and remembering that like I have a hard time reminding myself when I'm riding my bike up a hill like I want to be doing this like <laughs> I am so sweaty and sore and all of that like but I want to be doing this but legitimately remembering that that's a gift and that I am making the choice to create that and, and that in and of itself is a miracle it's like that old self-motivation. <laughs> self-motivation <laughs> all the ways. We could talk about this forever, huh? That's true. So what were you really vibing on in Dave's conversation? Well, I really liked when he started talking about getting in the flow. He was talking about it in regard to his conducting. And he was talking about doing something. He was talking about the thing that you do where time and everything else essentially dissolves and it was a phrase where he said it's in those moments where i feel untouchable that it reminded me of moments in in my life where i feel untouchable for me those moments are all around possibilities when i think about the space of possibility and abundance and when i don't allow or I don't get caught up in and to attach to thoughts that are about scarcity or what I can't do or what's impractical or any of that. But in my own words, when I remember that I literally have the power of the universe in my mind, body, and soul, and there is the space for possibility to create whatever, because we are co-creating every moment with the universe just by having the gift of being alive. And so that space of possibility, for me, sometimes there are those activities where I'm really into it, but it's just being in that space of possibility and believing in it for myself and for others, even as I'm talking about it, I am feeling untouchable because I believe so fully in it Mm -hmm. that it's just a mental state. And that makes me feel really excited. I'm like, I want to shout it from the rooftops or whatever. And so like, I'm really resonating with the value of being in that mindset, recognizing what brings you that mindset and doing more of. Yeah. And there are a couple ways to think about it. Tony Robbins calls it the state of absolute certainty, which for me is really about trusting the universe. Like you're saying, like you are not worried, you're not in the scarcity mindset, you're in the abundance mindset because you know this is all channeling through you right now and there's no need to worry or second guess. And I definitely feel that too when I'm playing the piano or when I'm freestyle rapping Mm -hmm. or the elusive moments when my writing gets in the zone, as as (laughs) Dave Dave called it, the zone of genius. (laughs) I think it's a challenge to get into the zone And into that state of flow. But if we can figure out how do you get into that state of flow? What's your access point? What kinds of things can you do Mm. to help set yourself up for that success? And letting it come to you or channel through you, however you conceive of the imagery. But I know for me with writing, usually it's around music. If I'm listening to a certain song, it helps calm the chatter in my brain and I'm able to focus just on the writing or sitting down at the piano or freestyle rapping. Those are ironically easier because it's the activity itself Mm -hmm. that creates the state of flow. So do you have something that gets you in that state of flow? Is there some kind of trigger or some way that you have to access it more consciously? Well, there are two. And the first that comes to mind is journaling Hmm. because it's a form of meditation and it also 
is releasing clutter and all kinds of stuff in my brain. So I'm able to find clarity and my inner voice that I can trust, which for me is like my access point to the divine. And the other structure that I have is actually attending spiritual community activities. Like I'm involved in a couple of them, but going there and being in the energy of the people there, whether it's unity and it's jubilant or it's my sangha, which is a lot more calm and peaceful, but there's this amazing energy of all of the people that are there and having a community of people. It just feels really validating and comforting and that I'm able to get into that flow. And I think there's a huge value around community. I'm a big fan of community. Mm. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> How would you describe Sangha for someone who might not be familiar with that? Yeah, so Sangha means community. And the tradition that I follow is Theravadan. So it's a tradition of Buddhism. And essentially I go and at the beginning we sit for 45 minutes together, which means we meditate quietly together. And after that, there is a speaker who talks about truth also called a Dharma talk. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, Dharma means truth. And so, yeah, it's just a way to uh, feed my soul in that sense. Learn more about mindfulness and all of the other lifestyle teachings. That's great that you have both personal and a communal way to access your flow and your zone of genius and that state of abundance and openness. That's really cool. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. I think it really helps. I think you can't underestimate the value also of having a group of people that have similar zone of genius access points. <laughs> like, so, yeah. That's great. Well, thank you all for listening to this conversation. And we appreciate Dave being with us. And we look forward to having another great talk with you all soon. Yeah, we appreciate you so much. Bye. <laughs> the Motivational Millennial Podcast is supported by Motivational Millennial Coaching Services. We help you find clarity and confidence so you can take action toward living your dream life. To learn more about one-on-one -on -one personalized support from someone who believes you have a path to fulfillment and wants to help you uncover it, visit motivationalmillennial.com slash coaching. For show notes and upcoming guests, or to learn more about Coactive Coaching, the blog, and our other awesome offerings, visit MotivationalMillennial.com. Keep in touch with us at Facebook.com slash MotivationalMillennial. We'd love to hear from you. Shoot us an email with your thoughts, comments, and suggestions at podcast at MotivationalMillennial.com. And tell us who you might like to hear from, or if you think you or anyone you know would be good for the show. The Motivational Millennial Podcast is edited by Christy Hostler and Team Podcast. Our theme music was composed and performed by Blake Brandis. Have, Have a great, great week, Motivational, motivational Millennials! millennials.